Hello, and welcome to the Kathleen Spracklin Podcast. I am a woman on a mission to get you up and running on your Zettelkasten. And today I had a really interesting opportunity to be uh, present at a meeting over in the Scott Shepherd community with the number of people up approaching 20 who were newcomers to the uh, Scott's book on the internet Zettelkasten. And of course they were filled with a number of questions. We narrowed it down to three or four so that we could fit it within the time frame. And the, the first questions just went right to the type of a question I would have expected to ask, questions on numbering, questions on bib cards. But when the topic came up of main cards, the questions that were asked left me with nothing really to contribute. So I thought I would share that with you, but what I really was surprised was at the question that wasn't asked, the really most fundamental question. So the kinds of questions that were asked were, how many main cards a day do you create? Um, how detailed are they? How many, how packed is your main card? Um, what is your process? How long do you wait after creating your bib card before you start creating main cards? But missing was the question, what goes on a main card? What bib notes are worth putting on a main card? The closest that it came was one of the participants basically said that he lets his bib card sit for a while so that he can decide later which items feel like they deserve to be on a main card. So I think that that question can be answered with a little bit more precision if we take a look at what is the function of the bib card and what is the function of the main card because it's very, very simple. They're quite different. They're quite distinct. And once you have that under your belt, you don't have to sit and let your bib cards cool so that you lose your attachment to them so that you can make a more rational choice. No, you're going to make a decision choice and then you will choose the question of how soon after you make a bib note do you want to make a main note. That kind of a question you can answer for yourself based on your work processes. At the very end of it I'll share my process with you but your process might be different. What I do want to share with you, however, is what, what is intrinsically so different between the, the bib card and the main card. And the interesting thing is that this is a question that Deb Hart asked over in Lillipub. And my only answer I could give her at the moment was, that's a very interesting question and certainly worth thinking about. But tonight, when that question wasn't asked was when it dawned on me how best to answer it. So I'm going to say that this video is for Deb. Okay, Deb, I think I have the answer to the question you asked a few days ago. So let's take a look at the cards and I'll see, I'll show you what I mean. Okay, let's see if I can share what I mean. A big card is something that you have in your hands when you're reading a book. It's like a little silo. Nothing comes in, nothing disturbs it. It's just you and the book. It, you, oftentimes people will actually take their bib cards and use them as a bookmark to say, well, how far did I get in the book today? And just continue to add their notes to cards. So the, it's just collecting the information from one source and the information can percolate, but it only percolates within its silo. This is a very focused form of learning and it's a very left brain form of learning. Your, organized, your organization plan is that which the author of the book provided for you and you have nothing other than your own thoughts, which may potentially intrude, nothing but your own thoughts would intrude into this silo. So now let's compare that to the nature of a main card. 
Main cards love to in interact. They're social animals. They dive into the box, and from the minute they land in the box, they're looking around for who they can chatter with. They love to party. They want to find out about everything that's going on around them and a heck, half a dozen other things that aren't even anywhere near them. They totally love to interact, even rather randomly. This is associative learning. It's a very right brain activity. So, let's find out if, based on these two definitions, can we decide which notes in a bib card will go into a main card. Okay, I'm going to throw out a random data point. Okay, the farm only produced 62 bushels of wheat that year. Does it go on a main card? No, it doesn't go on a main card because it's not prepared to socialize with other cards. It's the minute it joined that conversation with that statement, somebody would say, well, which farm? Well, which year? Well, why did it only produce 62 bushels of wheat? And that poor little card standing there all by itself wouldn't be able to add one more thing to the conversation. It would go mute and it would feel very embarrassed and it would be feel very sad that it came to the party at all and it would really like to go home and stay home. Let me throw out another one. Small farms in the region were deeply impacted by the major drought in 2022. Okay. Now, does that go on a main card or a bib card? It's closer. What region? Well, at least we know a possible cause. We know that it was a farm, same as the other one. And we, but we still don't know what region. So what you'd really want to carry over from your bib card to your main card would be the dramatic point that the author of this book, this source, intended to carry into the world. That author wrote his book because he wanted something to come out into the world. So what you want to find in the bib cards is what does the author want to contribute to the conversation? So you're going to look for a, a thought, thing, a summary, a, an inclusive statement that carries enough information all by itself that once that conversation gets out over here into this, to the party that's going on, the conversation won't be dead stopped. The conversation will continue and in fact it will spur conversation that would be very exciting. So now we might want to go ahead and say, the Pacific Mountain region, Northern Mountain region of Montana, was severely hampered by the drought of 1922. Some felt that it was might be an indication of climate change. Many farms were economically damaged to the near breaking point. Okay, now you've got something that can come over to the main card and get right into the conversation. It's a social conversation, and so that means that nobody in the party is going to pin them down to how many bushels, to from which farm. It's the idea. It's the idea there was a major drought. It affected Montana. It affected wheat growing. People were suffering. Farms were near bankrupt. That is something that can really get going in a conversation. So that is the card that's going to go onto your main card. Your main card is going to be a, a stimulating thought that gets the interaction going. Then, if it turns out to be very, very particular, and you're not just having this conversation, but now you're writing a, some kind of a paper or a magazine article or something that's more formal, you're going to take that card and you're going to come back to the bib card and you say, in point of fact, 
This farm, as an example, was only able to produce 62 bushels of wheat, whereas normally it produced this many, and it produced this kind of an economic disaster, and it was not alone. It's simply exemplary of. In other words, you would go back to the bib card to get all those isolated facts that would have then stopped the conversation, and you pick them up only when you need them to be able to complete your uh, a formal publication of some sort. So now that means this main card over here that came from this bib card needs to know what bib card it came from. That's going to be really, really important. And I believe it's equally important over here to know which thought that made it to a which thought made it to a main card and what main card it ended on because you might find that in in certain books different main cards end up going to different areas and you you might want to having looked at one over in this conversation another one participated in another conversation card and you want to find out um, how those conversations related so you really need the, the links from here to here, from here back to here. Link everything so that you can find those facts to support your generalization if the time comes and be ready to interact with another group who might be saying, well, that might be true of wheat, but strawberry production was through the roof in 1922. And I don't know any of these things as being facts. I'm just throwing them out there. So that is the kind of a thing that then can get going in a conversation. So I hope that helped with the answer for you, Deb, in terms of what goes on a main card and what goes on a big card. But one of the things that I would like to stress out of this is the importance of involving your right brain in your work. We all know how to bring our left brain to our work. We've done that all through childhood. We've done, we've done that through school. And if we're keeping a Zettelkasten, then we have a type of mind that is very readily organized and ready to do every left brain thing we can bring to our subject matter. The challenge and the genius comes when you bring your right brain into it. And that is a little bit more challenging because the right brain you know that's the brain of your dreams, that's the brain of your creativity. Much, much harder to marshal. And in fact, you're better off if you don't try to marshal it at all, because marshalling is a very left brain kind of a thing. What you really want to do with the right brain is you want to tempt it into working on your problem. Feynman is famous for his, well, for many, many things, the physicist Feynman, one of the things that he was famous for was his 12 problems, that he always kept a list of 12 problems that he was working on. Every time he had something new, the piece of information that came to light, he would weigh it against the 12 uh, problems to see, ah, does this impact, could this help, could this help, could this help? Well, that's a very conscious form of using your right brain, left brain. You're, it's a very left brain when you're doing it, but you're also reinforcing in the right brain that those 12 problems are very important, and so it keeps working on them in the background. Well, you don't have to be quite so enforced about it when you do your main cards strictly as the conversation cards, the associative cards. Because if what you're building out into your Zettelkasten isn't one of these associative things, if what you're really doing is capturing little silos under each of your main cards, so that you, this little card has a little silo tree underneath it, you've wasted space in your main card, you've wasted effort indexing, and you've dead stopped the conversation because the, it's the flow of ideas that you need when you get over into into the main box. Your main box should be your, your free-flowing interactions, your stumble-upon interactions, your, huh, well, I looked up that number wrong, but look at that interesting card that I'm looking at. Ha, ha, I should have been in that drawer, but oh my goodness, isn't that interesting? 
And all of these things have much higher probability of coming about when the cards that go into your system are all just excited, interactive ideas. And my goodness, a bib card is a very compact way to store and retain all of the supporting facts that will make you and any kind of a paper you write or any kind of a formal presentation you give will be very, very precise with the necessary facts that you can boop, 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 throw out there and support. But when you're at the cocktail party afterwards, you don't need those factoids. This is what you need. Thank you.